Here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report, as we turn now to a New York police officer, Ariel Palenko, who's been a vocal critic of the police department's stop-and-frisk program. I spoke to him yesterday and asked him to respond to last week's court ruling that puts on hold a sweeping set of changes to the New York City Police Department's controversial stop-and-frisk program. In August, U.S. District Judge Shira Shinlin found the program unconstitutional, saying police had relied on a policy of indirect racial profiling. She appointed a federal court monitor to oversee a series of reforms, but the city appealed her ruling. And last Thursday, an appeals court stayed the changes effectively allowing police officers to uh, continue using stop and frisk. That's where I began with Officer Polanco, asking him to respond to the appeals court ruling. Basically, I have to start with a legal um, statement, say, I'm not here on, be on behalf of the police department. That covers my legal—I'm obviously not here on behalf of the police department. I'm here as a citizen, which allowed me to express myself in the way I— It's a, it's a slap in the face. It's a, you don't expect this from a federal— um, Court. You expect this from the Board of Regents, where Bloomberg sent his people to lobby them. You expect this from um, a, a lower court that, that they are politically influenced to this. You don't expect this from the. They going against one of those most honorable judges they have, and that was not an appeal. People think that was not a formal appeal. Uh, that was more of a <coughs> political favor, is what I call it. Uh, when the decision came over, years and years after we've been struggling trying to get this to the air, uh, Major Bloomberg asked for one thing and one thing only, for the implementation not to go while he was on power. That's all he asked for. They created the mess. They did not want to listen to me. They did not want to listen to the city council. They did not want to listen to some of the city lawyers who told them this was not a good lawsuit to pursue. The only purpose of this decision, and um, is to grant Bloomberg's uh, wish, which is that he doesn't want to be watched while he's in power. And it's a shame. It's, it's really a shame. I want to turn to New York Police Commissioner Ray Kelly reacting to the appeals court ruling. I have always been, and certainly haven't been alone, concerned about the partiality of uh, Judge Shinlin. And we look forward to the examination of this case, um, a fair and impartial review of this case based on the merits. Your response, Officer Polanco? He's, he's out of touch. Ray Kelly, when was the last time he walked the beat? When was the last time he or his family went through a stop and frisk? Well, we know issues with his family, but um, when was the last time that the, they, they went down and, and they asked the cops, how do we feel about doing stop and frisk? Because I'm not the only one. I'm, on, I'm just the only one that had the nerves to bring it out. There's a lot of cops under there. There's a lot of supervisors under there, great cops, who are under fear. And for that fear, they won't speak about what they all know is wrong. I'm not against stop and frisk. I'm not against stop and frisk the way it's supposed to be done. How is it supposed to be done? When you are, as a police officer, when you fear that somebody is about to commit a crime, had committed a crime, uh, or you always in the process of committing a crime, you have the right to stop that person. You have the right to search that person if necessary, and if you are particularly the search. I'm not against that. And in, in reality is that in New York, most of the people you are going to stop, regardless of, of, of what the crime is, they're going to be black and Hispanic. That's the, we're not arguing that. But you cannot treat the whole black and Hispanic community as we're all about to commit a crime, or as we all committed a crime, or we all are about to commit a crime. It's not right. It's not right. You yourself have been stopped and frisked? Yes, I Explain have. Explain what As happened? a police officer. And, and they couldn't give me the courtesy of telling me why I was stopped. You weren't in uniform. I would know. I was not in uniform. I was walking in Washington Heights in my mom's uh, house and two, with two more officers. We are uh, walking down, and all of a sudden, uh, cops roll out of uh, our marked car and hit the wall. They pushed us against the wall. They did not ID themselves. They did not tell us we were cops. Obviously, we knew they were cops. Were they, they were undercover. Yeah. And they, uh, we asked them what's going on. We're on the job. That's how, you know, and they say, they look at us and say— You weren't off duty at the time. I was off duty, yeah. Oh, you were. And they look at us and say, what kind of job are you on? This is a white cop talking to another. I say, look in my pocket and you'll see what kind of job I'm on. 
And they look at my pocket, and sadly, they gave me the ID bag and kept walking. They did not say, I'm sorry. They did not say, officer, this is the reason why I stop you. Nothing. They just kept walking. And do you know them? Did you know no, them? No, no. And this you never is, saw them again? Never saw them again. And then talk about the moment you describe in the videotape that really um, made you reassess everything, that where you were being told to stop and frisk and detain. It's, it's, it's the quota system. The quota is illegal. They deny it, even with all the audio out there, even with all the victims that are coming up, even with the billions of dollars that they pay to cover police-related lawsuits, billions. You know how many after-school programs can be open with that money? How many kindergarten and pre-K can be open, but instead they pay uh, police misconduct with it? Um, it's, it's a really bad feeling. When they have a, a top-down management, uh, Kelly and Bloomberg synchronize, whatever Bloomberg say Kelly does, and um, they want numbers. I would think that if crime is lower, like they say it is, which is not, that if things are so well in New York, you should be arresting less people, not more. Hmm. You should be stopping less people because obviously crime is lower. They're shoving crime under the table, and I'm a big sample of that. I know I've done it. We were forced to do it. How? Tell me what you were You were to. called to a scene where the robbery happened, and they will look at the Comstock number for that week and tell you, oh, we're not taking that robbery. That will put us over the top. Or take the robbery, make it a, a lost property, or make it a... a Anything, or sometimes even It'll this— It'll put you over the top of too many crimes to report. Yeah, too, the city look bad. too many high crimes to report, so that, that way they can keep saying that crime is lower. I've been to shootings where I've been told in the report, don't put that a bullet went through the car, put that a sharp object went through the car. So now that shooting is not going to show up mm -hmm. in the annual report of shootings. And that's what they were doing. And I, I do not understand how can Kelly go up in TV with a straight face and say this is not happening. I'm Officer Polanco. Officer Borelli, Officer Schoolcraft, Officer Palestro, all from different precincts, all from different around the city. We all saying the same thing in different precincts, but yet nobody wants to believe, and they keep saying that this does, is. A, does this put people in danger? Of course, never... you hire less cops, because supposedly the, the the crime is lower. Now you're gonna justify not hiring enough cops because I'm, uh, supposedly you're doing the job. So the moment that you were being told to. Uh, take kids into custody. Explain that. That was my breaking point. I was an assistant dean in a high school. I, I was a baseball coach. I have kids my own. If you want me to arrest somebody, and I have never, ever stopped putting cuffs on anybody because they're white, because they're black, because they're blue. I will handcuff anybody who's committing a crime. But when you take that, he's a male black, he's 14, 14 15, he's walking down the corner, he doesn't look like he belongs here. Cuff him. Cuff him for what? Or coffin, we'll figure out inside. What happened behind that is that the commanding officer goes to his office and he sees the number of summonses that were written last year that he's going to be compared to next week. So if he doesn't have enough uh, stop and frisk to match that number or double it, and if he doesn't have enough summonses to match that number or arrest, he's going to go out there, he's going to create it himself. And um, the quarter. It's illegal. No matter how you cut it, it's illegal. I want to go back to 2009, to a recording that you made. In this clip, we hear a delegate from the Patrolman's Benevolent Association speaking during a roll call meeting at the 41st Precinct, where you, Officer Polanco, 41st. work, 41st in the Bronx. Uh, the captain refers to 20 and 1, a reference to the demand that officers make 20 summons, five street stops, and one arrest per month. So listen closely. Mostly. You can hear on that tape the captain at the 41st precinct saying 20 and 1 is what the union is backing up. They spoke to the union trustees. That's what they want. They want 20 and 1. 20 and 1 is a reference to the demand that officers make 20 summons, five street stops, and one arrest per month. So the union's backing this? Yes. Officer Polanco? Yes, the union is. And it's sad. It's really sad because when you are there as an officer, you have nobody to go to. You have absolutely nobody to go to. Am I going to go to my union, who's telling me what I have to do? Am I going to go to Internal Affairs, who's not going to do anything? I thought they were. They have no integrity. 
when it comes to investigating themselves, they have absolutely no integrity because um, they have shown. So who are we supposed to go to? Our union is not there for us. Our union is there for the police department, sadly. sadly to say. So, Officer Palenka, you testified in this stop-and-frisk trial. Talk about what happened after you signed um, a deposition. I, uh, I got approached by the Civil Liberty Union in 2009. They saw the piece on um, ABC7, where I, uh, I, I had nobody else to go to. I, I couldn't. Uh, I was deposing March of 2010. Uh, the next day that I show up to work, I was off for two days, uh, that I gave the deposition with many city lawyers. They didn't like what I provided. They didn't like the recordings. They didn't like my testimony. So I was placed on a suspension with no reason given for about three years. I was suspended with pay for about three years, where my job was to go to um, internal affairs every day for five minutes in the morning, sign a piece of paper, get my full salary as a cop, and go home for three years. Because they wanted you out to stop they, witnessing, they wanted me, perhaps me to stop recording. They wanted me to isolate. They wanted to isolate me away from. Um, but then they, uh, about a year ago, uh, they sent me to. Uh, I live in Rockland County. They sent me to Utica Avenue in uh, Brooklyn where I drive uh, an average of five hours a day to get to work. It's called highway, highway therapy. And I pay five tolls every day to go to work. I want to play the response of the NYPD's Deputy Commissioner of Training, James O'Keefe, when he was asked about police officers who have audio recordings of officials calling for stop and frisk quotas. Uh, O'Keefe was questioned by reporter Kim Langle. Commissioner, we've heard from former law enforcement officials, including current police officers, who say the training's not the problem, that it's, the training's actually great. They're saying it's the pressure from the higher-ups being forced to make more and more stops. I don't, I don't know that to be true. My responsibility is to be sure that they are prepared and well-trained to do what they're required to do. Can you comment on the recordings that have been circulating for the past couple of years? Recordings? Yes. Recordings. Recordings. What, what are you so what, what, recordings? what recordings? I mean, there's recordings from, you know, officers that they've collected during roll calls. They've testified in court that they've collected these recordings showing that top commanders are pressuring them to make more and more stops, get more and more 250s, more and more C summons. I, I wouldn't know how to respond to a, a blanket statement like that. Um, it's not a blanket statement. I mean, yeah, I don't know what all those recordings are. I don't know exactly which ones you're referring to. Our responsibility, here, our responsibility here is to be sure that everybody is properly educated and trained and prepared to do what the job assignment is. That's, that's, that's the realm of what we do here. So that's New York Police Department Deputy Commissioner of Training James O'Keefe when asked about police officers who have audio recordings of officials calling for these stop and frisk quotas. Your response to Officer O'Keefe, uh, Officer Palenka? Denial. He's denying it. The, the, they denying it at all costs. Imagine if I didn't make the recordings. How would I prove what I'm proving? And they listen to the recording, and they still denying it. Are they targeting certain neighborhoods? Yeah. And you can make the argument that the neighbors that they ask uh, targeting are the neighborhoods that have the most crime committed by black and Hispanic. But what percentage of black and Hispanic are committing this crime? And what percentage of black and Hispanic live in the neighborhood? Because one out of 100, uh, when you start, when you have one criminal, when you have two, 300 people who are not, why will you treat everybody as a criminal? Do you think the Department of Justice should investigate? They should. There's no question that they should. Uh, what is going to be left of the black and Hispanic community after stop and frisk? What is going to be left? Because if you educate yourself, and I've seen samples of kids who are arrested for trespassing where they live, kids who are given summons for trespassing where they live, the automatic uh, disorderly conduct obstructing governmental uh, uh, activity charge, that's when the cops stop you and you say, I don't have, yeah, I don't have to talk to you. Officer, why are you going through my pocket? Why are you throwing me against the wall? Once you ask that, then you're going to get arrested for this kind, disorderly conduct. You're going to spend a night in jail. The city's going to pay for it. But now you're going to go educate yourself, like a lot of black and Hispanic do. Now you're going to get a degree, and now you're going to go look for a job that's going to deny you the job because you, were, you have an a arrest record. How is that helping the community? Can you relate um, these large 
you know, massive stop and frisks. We're talking about, what, more than 700,000 in a previous year of largely young Latino and African-American kids, um, to shootings, uh, police shootings. Lamarie Graham. Lamarie Graham is a perfect sample. Marley Graham was Marley a Graham teenager who ran into his home as um, flushing marijuana down the, the toilet of his grandmother's apartment, and he is shot dead. That's why they said that he's flushing marijuana. Um, there's no reason to uh, there's no reason to pursue somebody for marijuana. There's no reason to go to their houses for marijuana. There's no reason to go in the bathroom for marijuana, and there's not a reason to put a bullet in some kid's chest because of marijuana. If Marijuana was there because um, we're getting the statement from the police department. It's, it's uh, instead of saving lives, that's a that's a sample of taking lives in reality. What do you tell your children? I they not old enough to have that conversation. I they have it with my ten year old, uh, and um, like I said, it's a conversation that unfortunately only some of us uh, have to have with our kids. It's not everybody who has to um, have the same conversation. Uh, stop and frisk works great. It works beautifully with white people. You know why it works so well? There's a study out there that said that white people, when stopped, are way far more likely to have drugs or contraband on them. You know why? Because the caution is taken before stopping them. You're not stopping them because they walk in the corner. You're not stopping them because they're coming from school. You are taking your time and you have a reason to stop them. Stop and frisk will work beautifully if instead of uh, 700,000 stop, you get 100,000 stop. But what is going to be your outcome rate? It's going to be a lot greater because you are taking the time to police. You are taking the time to do observation. And a lot of cops take Bloomberg as a sucker because um, they go out there and they grab the first guy at the corner two hours before tour. They want to make overtime which is not honest at all. A lot of cops want to—it's easy. It's the easiest way to, um, to be a cop is to go out there and pick whoever's at the corner, bring him back, instead of being a real cop, where you go, you interact with your community, they tell you who the drug dealers are. It takes time for you to know who's who, but the police department don't want time. They want numbers, and they want them right away. Can you just briefly summarize the case of Officer Adrian Schoolcraft, what happened to him? Adrian Schoolcraft— uh, Almost at the same time that I spoke up, he did the same thing. He did some recordings. I was not aware. I don't know him. Uh, and one day, the show, I don't know the whole full story, they, um, they went to his house and they put him in a psych ward and they did not even notify his family that he was in a psych ward for three days. So he couldn't reach his father. He couldn't no. reach his father. He couldn't do anything. And they still justify everything. And those people that did that against him, there's no accountability. Nothing happens to them. And is Schoolcroft an uh, officer today? No, he left. He left. Are you concerned about continuing to speak out, even after your year is suspended with pay, I'm you're back on up. the force? I'm not giving up. Nobody's speaking for us. I started talking against Stop and Frisk when nobody was involved. Absolutely nobody. That was New York police officer Adil Polenko. He was suspended with pay for more than three years after he began speaking out against the New York Police Department's stop and frisk procedures. He testified in the recent stop and frisk trial here in New York. He's now back as an active duty police officer, though, on modified assignment. To get a copy of today's show, you can go to our website at democracynow.org. Democracy Now is produced by Mike Burke, Renee Felsar, and Mate Nermin Sheikh, Steve Martinez, Sam Alkoff, Hani Masood, Robbie Karen, Dina Gesdor, Amy Goodman, with Nermin Sheikh for another edition of Democracy Now.